I'd also like to welcome everybody here today um, to our uh, meeting to discuss what is without doubt a seminal and extremely significant experience that the Australian working class or a section of the Australian working class is, uh, is experiencing. I think as Michael made clear, this attack, and really more correctly, this conspiracy, is uh, one that has been undertaken uh, by the um, combined forces of the Labor government, the media, uh, the coalition, the arbitration courts, the ACTU, and building corporations. This isn't aimed at the CFMEU uh, union per se, but really at the working class uh, in the building industry and more specifically, the wage levels and the conditions uh, that they have won. And it really isn't possible to understand the Labor government's decision to enact legislation that appointed an administrator to one of the largest unions in the country based on a commercial television show. I mean, that's what, that's what it was. Um, that made allegations that are to this day not tested and certainly not proven. So the issue is why now and why? And again, as Michael outlined, it's, that's answered only from the standpoint of the international conditions in which it's occurred. And those conditions are unprecedented for anybody uh, in, with living memory today. Mankind has once more reached what can only be called an economic social and political precipice characterised by a financial crisis, uh, the likes of which have not been seen, the turn to extreme right-wing fascistic forms of rule and war. The attack on Israel, uh, by Israel on Iran a little over 24 hours ago is an act of war. And it was an act of war that has the full approval and support of the United States. It raises to heightened levels the danger of broadening world war. Commentators and military specialists increasingly concede that the opening shots of World War III have begun. In fact, as the Washington Post stated on October the 7th, uh, 16th, and I quote, US participation in World War II actually began with aggressive and hardly neutral Navy patrolling of the North Atlantic shipping lanes on which Britain depended. And US participation in World War III began before this week's decision to send to Israel an advanced missile defense system and about 100 troops to operate it. Now, there, that is an, a, an increasingly open discussion, certainly being held amongst the more astute uh, commentators internationally. Two of these fronts are already underway and a third is being prepared. The first front is the Ukraine war against Russia, being funded and supplied by the US and NATO and is expanding to allow for NATO-supplied weaponry to now be deployed directly against Russia. This is despite Putin's warnings that he will resort to the use of nuclear weapons, which he justifies by the fact that nuclear-armed countries in the form of uh, the United States and NATO are, via a proxy relationship with Ukraine, attacking the Russian Federation. This growing danger is not the result of miscalculations or errors by imperialist leaders, but an outcome of long-held plans of the US and other imperialist countries. The breakup and dismemberment 
of the Russian Federation is a central plank by US imperialism to re-establish its international economic and political hegemony through war. The second front, Israel's war of extermination against the Palestinian people in Gaza, images that have horrified and appalled millions, is being extended to destroy the West Bank, Lebanon, and most significantly, Iran. The attack on Iran will, as uh, predicted, inevitably draw Russia and China into what would then become a global conflict between nuclear armed states. The brutality of Israel's genocidal slaughter is comparable only to the uh, war of annihilation carried out by the Nazis in World War II against the Jews. While these wars and war crimes unfold before the eyes of the world, preparations are proceeding apace in the Indo-Pacific to launch war against China, who is and has been identified by the United States as its main rival and threat. Vast swathes of the northern landmass of Australia have been handed over to the US military in the form of land bases, seaports, and intelligence capacities to be used against China. The Albanese Labor government has justified, funded, and aided the imperialist war aims of the US and NATO against all their purported enemies, against Russia. They have supported Israel's slaughter in Gaza, and they are a spearhead in the preparations for war against China. We are now nine days away from the US presidential election on November the 5th. To say nothing like these elections have been seen in the United States, certainly since the Civil War, would not be an exaggeration. Our movement has often stated that everybody on the planet should be given the right to vote in US elections because after all, the outcome affects everybody on earth. Nothing could be truer about this election. The two presidential candidates, despite their differences, represent only the interests of US imperialism, the oligarchs, the ruling class, and the massive corporations of the rich. The choices that the American working class are offered are between the war candidate in the form of Kamala Harris of the Democratic Party, who has overseen war in Ukraine, defended the right of Israel to butcher the Palestinians in the Middle East, and uh, the preparations for war against China. The alternative is the fascist, Hitler-loving MAGA Republican Party candidate, Donald Trump, who has declared if he wins, he will rule as a dictator from day one. His first act will be removing and deporting millions of immigrants from the country. If he doesn't win, and he could win, amazing as that may be, he could win uh, in nine days' time. He has, but if he doesn't, he has already stated he won't accept the result and has put in place already over 90 legal challenges throughout the different states, organised his fascistic uh, Supreme Court appointments to hear those challenges, mobilised the right-wing layers centred uh, predominantly in the military and the police apparatuses uh, to suppress opposition, and will illegalise all opposition and jail or assassinate his opponents. This election has been characterised by a level of violence not seen for many decades, with two and possibly three assassination attempts against Trump, along with the increasing attacks on democratic rights. Those attacks include the decision by the US Supreme Court ruling that, uh, uh, ruling that uh, allows unlimited power to the president to violate the Constitution 
and break any law whenever he decides uh, and will be immune from prosecution. In other words, the President of the United States will rule as a dictator. So while the differences between the various wings of the US ruling class are not inconsequential, they are, however, tactical. There are no strategic differences by either the Democrats or uh, the Republicans. Both sides agree the need for US imperialism's dominance on a geostrategic scale and at home. Both agree that the working class must pay for uh, the war effort through intensified exploitation, the evisceration of democratic rights and the suppression of the class struggle. In other words, both agree on a war economy. The dominance of the American oligarchs in the election is most grotesquely demonstrated by Elon's, Elon Musk's declaration that he would pay $1 million a day to a randomly selected individual who signs a right-wing petition to uphold the First and Second Amendments uh, of the, the Constitution. These amendments include the right to religion and to keep and bear arms. The mechanisms of rule of the United States, which have been utilised for hundreds of years, along with the agreements, the pacts, the treaties signed, uh, which were the basis of the post-war period, are being dispensed with. And this is not just because of the emergence of Donald Trump. He is certainly the sleazy, grotesque and crooked real estate New, New York tycoon. But if it wasn't Trump, there would be somebody else that would emerge. This political situation has changed because the bourgeoisie, and not just in the United States, can no longer rule through the well-worn mechanisms that in fact they preferred through parliament, through the democratic processes. But those um, methods and processes are no longer possible. The underlying contradictions of capitalism have reached a point where the, the capacity to rule through uh, the, the uh, uh, methods of democracy have been, uh, have been passed. Now, these also were the conditions that arose in the first half of the 20th century, and they resulted in economic depression, mass poverty, huge inequality, and two world wars, resulting in the greatest loss of human life in history. And this is not just a, a, a situation which exists within the United States. Every government, including that of, a, of the Labor government in this country, is turning to war. The wars being conducted and further planned abroad coincide with the assault against the working class at home. Only last Tuesday, the Albanese government announced the purchase of standard missile two block triple IC medium to long range surface to air missiles at a cost of $7 billion. Now this is just one of the purchases and allocations of government expenditure to the military that has been enacted over the past few years. There was no discussion on this purchase. There was no vote in parliament or by the population. Last week, we wrote in the World Socialist website referring to this purchase, and I quote, the costs involved are vast because $7 billion is not uh, the end of it. As our article went through, the AUKUS nuclear submarine program is earmarked at $368 billion alone. Some 16 billion to 21 billion have been allocated to domestic military manufacturing, including missiles. 
while another 30 billion are for off-the-shelf acquisitions such as the Raytheon missiles. Labor has boosted defence spending to more than $50 billion annually, a figure that it has said will increase by a cumulative $50 billion over the decade. But with many of the programs not yet budgeted, it is inevitable that the true sums will be far greater, meaning a stepped up offensive against essential social services, such as health and education to pay for war. These are eye-watering amounts of spending. But when the call is made for hospitals, schools, wage rises, infrastructure, we are told there is no money. This is under conditions in which ordinary people increasingly can't afford to go to the doctor <clears throat> due to the elimination of bulk billing. There is a housing shortage that is incomparable uh, for many, many decades. Workers on the minimum wage can't afford to buy a home. And in fact, increasingly, groceries are becoming out of reach. So let us look at just what $7 billion would pay for if it wasn't spent on war. It would build 127 hospitals. It would build 233 high schools. It would build 14,000 houses. And it would pay for the employment of 87,000 nurses and 70,000 teachers. These are what mankind needs. But what is taking place in this country with broadening levels of inequality, of poverty, of the inability for the newer generations to buy the basic tenets of life, this is what life really now is under capitalism. It will not be, the $7 billion will not be spent on the hospitals and the education and the nurses and the teachers. What will happen is that it will be gouged from government budgets and by forcing up uh, productivity of the working class. There is a deep and growing opposition and hostility to the conditions of life being imposed upon broad sections of the working class in this country. And in fact, increasingly it is clear that it cannot be imposed peacefully. And so it is under those conditions that the attack on the CFMEU was orchestrated. Why, I mean, and Michael has explained it. Why the CFMEU? Because they proved incapable of suppressing wages to the levels that the corporations and the government required. Why the CFMEU? Because it is a militant union. It is one of the largest unions in the country and because it was going to be and has been made an example to every other section of the working class. You do this, you demand wage rises uh, and you will have this, these measures being carried out against you. The 25% wage rise that the, the building workers received, which let's remind ourselves was over four years, it uh, did not only not really cover inflation, it certainly didn't cover the wage freezes that had been imposed since the pandemic. But the fact that this was carried out and uh, these measures were undertaken could not have been carried out by a Labor government alone. It required the coordinated uh, forces of the government, the ACTU, the Fair Work Commission, and the multi-billion dollar building companies to ensure that administration went through. But the essential element is that the CFMEU leadership allowed this to be imposed. They didn't oppose it. And the, the, uh, what is now revealed 
between uh, of the deals be between Setka and, and Zach Smith is that they would have accepted it. In fact, they were in negotiations with the Fair Work uh, Ombudsman <clears throat> to carry this through as long as their positions were guaranteed. In fact, uh, the revelations that have been uh, uh, aired that in fact the deal was done and the government reneged on it are uh, increasingly uh, apparent and true. But see, while this action was a shock to building workers today, this was not the first time that such measures had been carried out against workers in the building industry. Why did it come as a shock? Why were the, the uh, signs not, uh, not seen by building workers? Because the history of their own experiences have been denied them. The blueprint, in fact, for what has taken place over the last six months was actually undertaken almost 40 years ago in 1986 when the Hawke-Keating Labor government deregistered the Builders' Labourers' Federation, which in fact was the forerunner of the CFMEU. Hawke and Keating achieved what the Fraser government, had, the Liberal government, had been unable to do, but who had be, uh, begun the process in 1981. This was a period, the early 1980s, was a period of immense economic and political crisis internationally. It was in the period in which the Reagan in the United States, Thatcher in the UK, Hawke and Keating in this country, David Longy in New Zealand, undertook the measures that were to uh, claw back the historic gains that the working class had won uh, and uh, uh, carry through what were uh, the assaults on the rights, wages and living conditions and working conditions of the working class that really had not been seen for decades. In April 1983, one month after the Hawke Labor government was elected and before Parliament sat, the Wages and Incomes Accord was convened. This pact was one that had been drawn up by the Hawke government, the unions, the ACTU, the major corporations, and tied workers. This was a conspiracy against the Australian working class, and it tied wages to indexation and arbitration. This resulted in the greatest destruction of jobs, of conditions, of wage levels and rights of the working class really for uh, since the Second World War. Increasing numbers of laws of uh, legislation were enacted, both state and federally, to suppress the rights of the working class to take industrial action. And this was backed by renewed powers granted to the Supreme Court to issue injunctions against organisations inducing breaches of employment contracts. What that means in English is that anybody who called for a, a fight for a, 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 a industrial action for strikes would be therefore uh, seen to be inducing breaches of employment contracts and therefore illegal. Norm Gallagher, the Builders Labourers uh, Federation National Secretary and member of the Maoist wing of the Communist Party of Australia, in 1983 was serving a three-month sentence in Pentridge Jail over a long-standing contempt charge. Gallagher had been uh, promoted, had been uh, touted, as really one of the firebrand militant trade union leaders um, of the period. However, in this period, with the government's agreement, Gallagher was released early 
uh, from Pentridge Jail in order to attend the Labor uh, government, Government's Accord Summit. So this pact, which was being organised and had to be agreed to by the union leaders in conjunction with the government uh, and the building corporations, required Gallagher's presence. He was released from, from jail, went straight to the Accord um, and voted for the summit's final communique endorsing the uh, Labor ACTU Accord. In 1984, in exchange for Labor dropping the deregistration proceedings against the BLF, which, as I said, had begun by the Fraser government in 1981, Gallagher signed a code of conduct with the ACTU. This was a code which he didn't uh, get a vote for from any member of, of uh, the union. Workers were not uh, consulted. He voted for this code of conduct, which agreed that the union, the BLF, would eliminate industrial action in support of wage claims and conditions and settle disputes in a manner consistent with the economic strategy of the federal government. That meant that it was illegal. It was illegal to actually carry it. And Gallagher signed this. At the same time, he was uh, again hauled before the courts over corruption allegations that he had received secret commissions from construction companies in exchange for exempting their sites from industrial disru disruption. Sound familiar? Um, the allegation arose from a Royal Commission into the activities of the BLF launched some three years before by the Liberal Fraser government. These corruption charges, which also included that he had houses that was, were built or assisted in building um, that he hadn't paid for, that the, the building uh, companies had, uh, had supplied him. Just as now, the corruption charges against Gallagher were to play a decisive role when the Hawke government finally moved <coughs> to deregister the BLF federally in 1986. The charges, the corruption charges served as the pretext for union officials around the country to declare the BLF a rogue union and to either join in the assault or refuse to lift a finger in its defence. The Stalinist-led unions of the BWIU, the Building Workers Industrial Union, played a particularly pernicious role in ensuring the, re the deregistration went through. And the measures that were used against building workers, builders and labourers, were particularly vicious, designed to intimidate the working class and deter further resistance to the accord. On major building sites in Victoria, in particular in Victoria, but not just there, the BLF stronghold, builders, labourers were rounded up by the BWIU officials. Let's remember, the BWIU were Communist Party-led uh, union. So their officials rounded up uh, builders' labourers, accompanied by management and police. They were ordered to sign over to the BWIU immediately, which meant that they had to uh, relinquish their membership of the BLF and sign over the, to, the, to the BWIU. Those who refused were sacked on the spot and blacklisted into the, in, in the industry. <clears throat> While Gallagher ranted and raged and fumed, the one thing he refused to do was organise a united and unified struggle against the Hawke Labor government and the ACTU. An entire union had been eviscerated from the face of the earth. It had been outlawed and dismembered. Its, its membership were cannibalised by other unions. There was enormous opposition 
widespread opposition, certainly within the building industry, but also more broadly, to this action and also to the wholesale destruction of shop floor, shop floor organisations of the working class. Why didn't Gallagher take up this fight? The same reason that SETCA hasn't today, that Smith hasn't, that the CFMEU hasn't, because he knew that a political struggle against the Labor government could take an independent path, a political path that would be outside of their control. And they feared that far more than they feared the actions of the government, the deregistration of their union, uh, and because that could have resulted in the development of a, a political movement against the very capitalist system that they defend. How many experiences do workers have to go through of, these, of this nature, of this calibre, not just building workers, but the entire working class as a whole? How many times do workers have to endure these betrayals at the hands of their organisations and their leaderships. Until there is a fight for a new socialist revolutionary leadership, it will be the order of the day because the trade unions, even in their heyday, were never anti-capitalist. They were never opposed to the existence of the capitalist system. But nevertheless, the, the deregistration of the BLF was certainly a turning point. Um, and it, it indicated, it was an expression, not just of the perfidy of the BLF or the BWIU or the ACTU, but of trade unions internationally as, and as a whole. The period where they uh, got uh, scraped at times begged for the crumbs from the capitalist table, had long gone. They had been transformed into the policemen of the working class in the interests of capitalism. The backroom deals, the agreements, the conspiracies behind the backs of their members were designed to ensure that the working class did not embark on an independent political and socialist path. There is no question that there are many layers of workers and young people looking for answers to what are undoubtedly the historical questions of our, of our day. It is, in fact, out, uh, unfolding around us. The question is raised is not what sort of future our younger generations, the new youth of, of today, uh, will have, but whether there will be a future at all. The fact that nuclear armed countries are now facing each other off in, in uh, the prospect of war. The fact that once again, uh, the world faces the danger of nuclear conflagration to levels not seen since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis is an expression of the very uh, bankruptcy crisis and incapacity of capitalism to exist uh, peacefully or outside the complete destruction and evisceration of the rights and the conditions of the, the mass of the population internationally. The historical experiences of the working class, uh, the lessons, uh, even if one looks at even the lessons of the building industry, they have been uh, denied to today's generation of youth. In fact, they have been denied uh, to even those workers who experienced it, other than those who went through it in our party. But in order to understand not just what is happening today, but what has to be done, one has to turn to history. One has to go back and look at the lessons of the experiences of uh, the working class past. Only then can the outstanding tasks of the 20th century be resolved. Those outstanding uh, tasks include and are centrally uh, the resolution of the crisis of revolutionary leadership. It is the only means 
by which the fight against the source of war, the source of the attacks against the working class as a whole, which is capitalism, can be carried through. Our meeting has been called to discuss those questions. It has been called to that end. And we urge you to join and take your place in that struggle. Thank you.